All right. Hello, everyone. We're yeah, we're live. Welcome, everyone. We have some people starting to come in today. Uh, welcome to our new webinar. I'm Maxine Schnepp, the Career Development Manager here at CG Spectrum College. And with me today, I have George Razon. He is a VFX supervisor at Soho VFX, and he's also one of our newest CG Spectrum mentors. Welcome, George. All right. Yeah, thanks for the intro. And thanks no for putting problem. this together, Maxine. No problem. My pleasure. Um, so just as a little intro, um, as I said, George is one of our newest CG Spectrum mentors, and he has experience teaching at Centennial College here in Toronto, Canada as well. Um, and he also has a background as an effects artist, a CG supervisor. So George has a wealth of knowledge when it comes to working in the VFX industry. So we're really looking forward today to chatting about your experience as a supervisor, um, some tips that you might have for graduates of the school who are looking for new jobs now, and also just some of your experiences working on some awesome shows like The Boys, Game of Thrones, Umbrella Academy. We have some really awesome uh, stuff to look at today and some great little before and after clips that George has put together, so I hope everyone enjoys it. Um, and for everyone here who's watching, feel free to say hello in the chat. I'll be looking at the chat this whole time to see if anyone has any questions, um, any comments about what we're looking at. There's also a question and answer section. We'll be going over most of the questions at the end, um, but feel free to answer or ask them and then we'll answer them as we come around. Um, let us know where you're from. I know we have a lot of international students here at CG Spectrum College, but there are a ton of other people who signed up for this webinar who are not CG Spectrum students. So we're always curious to see where you're from um, and why you're interested in this webinar today. I already see one of my former students there. Oh yeah, nice. <laughs> hey Jihu, how's it going? So why don't I introduce myself a bit? So yeah. uh, for anyone who, who doesn't know who I am. So I've, uh, I've been in the industry, VFX industry since 2002. I started out pretty much like anyone else, finished my schooling and actually I got a chance to start in a small um, commercial house where we did a host of different commercials. But actually our main project in that particular place was to work on a show called Star Hunter. Back then it was, it was a big deal because it was one of the first I think it is the first show that got aired in HD. So that was a big deal back then. Wow. Yeah. Now, now everything. <laughs> I remember that. <laughs> okay. Yeah. And uh, yeah, so that's kind of where I started out and I spent the first couple of years of my, of my um, experience as an artist over there and actually got to learn a lot. So mostly because it was a small team and we were forced to do a little bit of everything. And then shortly after that, I actually joined Soho, where at the time was only 12 people. And same thing, because it was a very small team, you got a chance to do a little bit of everything. So then that's where I kind of did a little bit of animation, a small amount of comping, a lot of lighting, and then I sort of went from lighting to dynamics, mostly with Maya. Then I moved a little bit after so many years of working there and uh, I joined Pixo for a few years where I was here in Toronto, forced, right? Yep. Here in Toronto where I was forced by one of the supervisors there to, to use Houdini and uh, I've actually enjoyed using Houdini since. And so my role these days, it kind of bounces around doing VFX supervision, depending on the project I'll do, a lot of CG supervision as well. And I'll even do R&D using Houdini and some effects work, really depending on the project. So I, I kind of take on different roles, probably depending on the time of the year. <laughs> yeah, adaptable and stuff, yeah. right? I, I think that's the a big thing that everyone's had to learn this year too, um, especially with all the changes in the industry is you know, what other values you can bring to the company as an employee as a supervisor, um, when people are now working from home, I'm sure that has been different. What have your experiences been so far working from home? Uh, actually, I haven't been working from home a whole lot. 
the supervisors and our IT producers, we, like the, the main uh, sort of management team, we are going in the office. It's just easier for us to review work, but we right. are keeping all our artists off site just to be safe. And uh, it's been good. I have to admit it was a bit rough at the beginning just because of that, that sudden transition from everyone collaborating personally at, at work to going off site. And right. you know, with, with the connection, some people can't figure out how their camera works. Some people don't have cameras. That yeah. becomes a bit troublesome, but now it's actually fairly smooth. Yeah, and did did people get to take computers home? Because I know in some cases, like for myself, for example, at my last job, when I moved to work from home, I didn't actually have my own working laptop. Like my own personal laptop was so old <laughs> that it wasn't, you know, good enough. I've been so used to working off of computers that were work computers, you know, company property. Um, so luckily I had one that I could take home, but I know that, um, you know, depending on your situation, there's artists, you know, in different parts of the city or, you know, they might not be able to, to take, you know, company stuff home. So I know it's, it was such a, a difficult time for, I think all companies and all artists involved this year, trying to transition to this work from home thing, you know, on paper, it sounds so nice and easy until you actually have to think about the logistics of what does our day look like and how do you communicate with all these people? Yeah. So yeah, it's, it's definitely interesting to hear about. So we'll start off by talking a little bit about your role as a supervisor. So this can be, you know, whether we're talking as a VFX supervisor, overseeing the creative vision of an entire, you know, project or scene, or even going, you know, deeper as your time as a CG supervisor. Um, tell us a little bit about what that's like and what your, your sort of overall role is and what your day-to-day -day looks like. Yeah, so like I said, really depending on the project. So uh, Game of Thrones in particular, since that's what's over here. This one, uh, we had a lot of creative input on the actual show. Sometimes the supervisor on set they they don't care what you do as long as it looks good but others are more involved with driving the look of everything so mm -hmm. in this particular show we did have a lot of creative uh input in it they provided us with some some artwork from their uh, their concept department concept art department and um, we tried to match it as close as possible for most shots and then the rest is really just being able to tell the story of whatever is happening in, in the particular shot. But as for my role as a supervisor, at least, a lot of it is really making sure that the client is happy with the work that you're doing and mm -hmm. that whatever message it is that's coming from the supervisor or director, those are getting translated properly to the artists. So it's a lot of feedback and then making sure that, you know, shots get done on time. And so that's kind of a bit more work that, that sort of um, gets planned out with our producer. Right. And something that, that me and you had talked about, um, you know, before today with our experiences, um, you know, one of the, the sort of values that I know you, you think about a lot and that you preach to some of your students and, and um, an artist that you work with is this whole idea of this less is more approach. I think a lot of students that are studying to be in VFX, they always, you know, think of VFX as the big explosion or in the hero shot and, you know, the, the dragon in the scene, which is all really important and someone does have to do that, but so much more of the work involved, you know, is how can we do this in less time or how can we do this with less resources being used or how can we do this in an easier way to get the same final result um so tell me a little bit about that and how you sort of uh work with your team to to get those kind of results yeah that's that's a really good point to bring up um i mean the goal is always to use as little resource as possible and still generate very high quality work. So 
I mean, um, I mean, the goal I think is to to make sure that you get the work done on time. And what tends to happen a lot is if you overthink the shot, then you're going to create this overly complicated thing that might be difficult to adjust. Which, you know, it's it's a trap that we all kind of fall into. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you just have to look back and say, hey, uh, do I want to keep going down this road or do I want to simplify this because maybe this is not even what the client wants. So I think with all the complicated tools and software that we have, it's very easy to fall into that trap. So I think it's, it's a good idea to just to assess the actual issue with the team and, and think about the best solution for it. And that's, that's generally how we do things at Soho is that we, we always try to come up with the most efficient way to solve something. And some of it, sometimes you can, you can come up with something, but sometimes you can't because of the nature of whatever shot it is, you know, mm -hmm. uh, if, if you are somehow rendering water, there's, I don't think there's a whole lot of shortcuts to take in order to make that more efficient. There's right, exactly. Yeah, it either looks like water or it doesn't. <laughs> like <laughs> yeah, plus you can't get away. It's very difficult to get away from doing the long simulation. But sometimes you can, you can cut corners and it'll still look good. And then right. with the first thing you said, um, students doing the, wanting to do the big explosion, I think that's kind of, uh, I'll blame YouTube for this one. Um, I think, I think we see a lot of amazing visual effects work. You see it on uh, all the platforms, you see it in the movies, but you never really, no one really sheds a whole lot of light in most of the VFX work that's actually out there. So I'd say, um, a good 70, 80% of the work that Soho does are invisible effects, things that you would never think that we did anything on. I mean, ideally, that is what good visual effects is. You, you don't know that it's been done. So, yeah, yeah. You can't really tell the, the difference. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it's I, not until you see the before and after or the, or the breakdowns. That like, oh, that was VFX. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Mind you, some of the stuff I brought today was, was a bit in your face. I, yeah. I, personally, I personally like the little ones that's so well integrated that you can't tell that it was CG. Or you have to question yourself that, Oh, is that thing actually CG? So yeah. That's, that's what I'd like to see the most personally. And I think it's still important to have an interest in some of those, you know, higher fantasy shots too, because that's what gets people interested in this to begin with. Like, sure. I don't think many people get into this industry thinking about, oh, I can't wait to, to paint out phone wires and, <laughs> you know, tracking markers. That's, I can't wait to do that. People come into this industry to to do those high fantasy shots, to to work on the dragons, to work on some of yeah. the the special things that they see in movies and TV shows and in video games. That that's what gets them hooked. Um, yeah. But yeah, there's there's a there's a big gap between that stuff that gets you hooked and those entry level jobs. Um, so next, sure. we'll take a look at some. Um, some shots that George has brought with us from a few different shows. So first we'll look at um, a couple of scenes from Game of Thrones. So just walk us through what, um, what the process was here. So this is the breakdown so we can see that there is, um, this was the, the shot, we see some cranes, there's a green screen on the side for some set extension. So let us, tell us uh, what happened here. Yeah, so I thought it would be fun to show this one. So you can see that the first shot, that overhead shot that we're seeing, the very long one, um, the camera's pulling out and it's just revealing the plate of what was uh, what we need to replace. So the idea was to extend all the pyres of the people that died from the battle. So we had to build all those pyres, put all the dead bodies there, and then add some smoke and fire in, in all those different shots. So there's actually a whole sequence for this. Uh, I only just took two of the, two of the shots. Mm -hmm. But if you pause it here, Maxine, yeah. so you can see here that there's only five pyres there and then the rest oh, is yeah. green screen and dirt. So we extended that ground 
with a mix of matte painting and a lot of modeling and also proceduralizing some of it because it's extremely dense and you don't want to have unique geometry for every single one. Right. And you can also see Winterfell has some, they only built part of the set because it would probably cost too much money to build the whole thing. Yeah. <laughs> It'd probably take forever. Again, so, the, the idea of cutting, not necessarily cutting corners, but how can we do this more efficiently? It goes for every stage in the pipeline, not just visual effects, but especially in production where, I mean, look at even just all of the crew members involved in a shot this big. Yeah. A fun fact with Winterfell is uh, we actually got a lot of uh, references for Winterfell on what it used to look like from previous episodes because we had to, at the end of the day, it had to look like Winterfell. Right. Oh, sorry, not episodes, previous seasons. Seasons, yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, the thing with Winterfell is it actually changed on every single season of Game of Thrones. So if you want to look back, you can see that it, it looks slightly different. Just oh. the amount of um, shrubbery and snow that's there and even some of the, the towers, those are a little bit different. So anyway, we, we had to rebuild the whole thing and replace, replace the um, areas there that's missing. Yeah. Added the fires, added some smoke, and did a lot of simulations with the fire. Uh, if to you to match some of the practical ones too, that's right? right. So yeah. Can you pause it on this one as well? So yeah. we were fortunate that the production side shot this and they were initially trying to do this practically, but it was too difficult to control the fire and they weren't liking how the fire was looking here for some reason. So then there was the need to do some CG fire. That's so now if we move on to the next couple shots. So there's actually, I think a row, I don't remember the exact oh. number now, but there's Sorry over about that. Yep. I went ahead <laughs> by accident. Okay. But for the pyres scene, there's there's over a hundred of these pyres and it would have took a tremendous amount of data and time to simulate a unique fire here. So we did do a little bit of cheating and recycling of the simulation. So what oh, we did okay. was we simulated one pyre or actually a, a whole, a bunch of them with much longer frame sequences. And then we clone them over the respective one that matches that shape. Oh, I see here, yeah. In that yeah, turnaround. so that's how we were able to do all, um, all the different pyres within the time that we had. And it looks so realistic too. Like you guys did a really good job of matching the, the practical reference, like the, the few that were shot together. Um, yeah, that's really well done. I'm sure our senior FX <laughs> artists will be happy to hear that from you. <laughs> well, again, it's like I remember watching it, but you know, when you look back at some of these breakdowns, there's so much happening in a show like this that could be CG or could not. Like, you know, yeah. you could assume that all of these flames were CG. That's probably what I would have guessed if I had to if I had to think about it um, looking back. So it's interesting to see how much of it is practical, how much you're retaining from the original shoot and what you're adding to sort of match in. So, so that's pretty cool. Um, we have another clip from Game of Thrones. So we'll play this one now. And so this is one of the really big ones that you had to do, obviously. Yeah. <laughs> so that's the whole, um, the whole town there. So walk us through what, uh, what you did here and what some of the challenges were. Yep, for sure. Uh, why don't we start at the beginning and maybe pause it for a second? Yeah. So there we go. this was a mixed shot where we were sharing assets between, uh, I forgot which vendor now, but we were sharing assets. They did the dragons and we did Winterfell. Okay. So we were taking care of Winterfell extensions pretty much for the entire episode. And in this particular shot, it's just um, the dragon sweeping by, which is which is fine. There's tons of 2D work to do here and integration as well. There it is. And then yeah. one thing with Winterfell mm -hmm. that kind of made it challenging is that it's, it wasn't just all about 
building this one asset and then you're done with it. We actually, it had different sort of um, stages. So at one point, they're digging up the ground. And then another point, the entire army's there and all the tents were there. So if you play this forward, then you can see all the campsites oh. were there. Sorry. When I click, it like goes ahead in my presentation. Oh, that's that's, that's great. We're having, a, we're having a good time here. So okay. around here, you said? Uh, yep, yep. So this was actually based off of some artwork that we received from production. So okay. there's actually a whole mix of different kinds of tents there and campsites from the Dothraki and the Unsullied. Oh, yeah, they're, there. they're all sort of mixed there. And we scattered some crowds doing some, some of them are walking around, some of them are digging. Right. Yeah, it's hard to tell when you pause it because it's a little bit blurry. But yeah, I can see some of those, the different people around doing stuff. There's different, like a campfire over here. That's really yeah. cool. And uh, the entire ground is uh, pretty much a matte painting that's been projected. So it's, this is pretty much our entire team coming together and putting together the shots for these couple uh, shots we're looking at right now. Right on. And yeah, here we can see the full model of the, the city. That's so impressive. Yeah, so we got some procedural, partially procedural trees, some procedural snow. Once again, matte painting at the very bottom layer and also adding details uh, just to save us a little bit of time. I'm just gonna let yeah, this play so through one more time. <laughs> it's so fun to watch. Yeah. Awesome. So we'll go to the last um, series of Game of Thrones shots that were, were done by Soho VFX. So there's a few different themes here or different, you know, works done here. So I'll let it play through once first and then we can talk about some more specifics that you did. Yeah, you can probably just let this one loop. Yeah. So I thought it'd be fun to not just bring those crazy shots that that had a tremendous amount of CG in it. So some of these were mostly enhancements, which I think was, at least for me, it was fun to do as well. And the turnaround time was a lot shorter, so you're not stuck on a specific shot for so long. So I think the turnaround time was quite short with a lot of these, actually. Right. So in the battle scene, we added some blood on the swords, and you know they're obviously not running around with real swords. They they were actually flopping around like the so, rubber swords, right? Yeah, rubber swords. I've seen I've seen those before. Those are actually so annoying to remove because you have to, <laughs> or like fix because you have to remove the yeah. rubber sword because it's flopping, and then recreate a new one either in two D or or three D yeah. depending on the shot, right? That's right. So we had to we had to track it and um, add the blood in the tips, but we couldn't add too much blood because uh, you know it has to be a certain had to adhere to a certain amount of ratings or they don't want it to be too gory. Oh, interesting. I always thought that the show was pretty gory too. <laughs> I thought so too, but we That's did interesting. Get they still had standards. I think uh, they just didn't want too, too much. Although that shot there was the guy getting cut in half. Yeah, that's a lot. <laughs> they had their, they had their limits. Right. Or maybe because they had, maybe it's like a ratio thing, like because they had so much gore in another episode or another scene, like, you know, the guy getting his eyes. Yeah. Yeah. They, you know, <laughs> that, that scene. <laughs> you might be right about but that. Then maybe they have to like balance it. Like some other parts can't be that, that gory. Um, we, we also got a little bit maybe too, too uh, creative in our initial versions where maybe some of them looked like they were just spewing out, you know, a hose of blood. Maybe. Right. So they, yeah. They down the blood amounts. Yeah. And which is, some... which is more for like, yeah, horror movies and stuff like, like, you know, some shows they like it to be exaggerated so that you can really yeah. see it. And then I think this one is probably a little more based in reality you don't really see anything like squirting blood it's more realistic yep 
there's also a lot of uh, these smoky kind of shots. So we've enhanced the shots with smoke. They had a little bit, but there was a whole uh, battle scene that was happening before these. So they really wanted to accentuate the amount of smoke that's, that's in the scene. That makes sense. And then the and tree here, so this, they didn't like the one that was created on set. So it actually barely had any leaves, but the one you've seen here, we filled in the tree and sort of made it look more full. Okay, so yeah. So you enhance the tree, I like that. Yeah, so these are a lot of enhancement shots that was primarily done in 2D with not a whole lot of CG elements. Nice. Which is so, pretty much, yeah, that's a bulk of uh, a lot of our shots. So that's why there's so many comp positions available most of the time. Right, that, that makes a lot of sense, yeah. So for this one, it was like a 2D matte painting then or like a 2.5D matte painting to add the pockets of leaves or was it like strictly comp where they like clone some of the existing We ones? did a mix. So some of it is from a matte painting and uh, a lot of it was from doing clones as well. But you kind of hit a wall with cloning stuff to a certain uh, degree. Yeah. Yeah. Start looking like clones. So some of it is painted. Nice. Well, yeah, it looks really, I remember this scene. It's a, such a key moment. So it, it's a lot of what, you know, what we do in VFX is about totally enhancing moments like this to make them that much more memorable. You know, if the tree wasn't as full, I don't know if it would have the same impact of like meeting at this specific tree right w whatever their reasoning is yeah. behind it <laughs> they just couldn't build it they, they, it was uh two sticks and some amount of leaves yeah yeah it, or it would take too long for them to do it um practically so yeah yeah that's cool and, uh, the guy that gets chopped in half so he actually had um some sort of prop attached okay. to his body where he was cut there but we obviously added the sword that's coming down and uh, we've also enhanced the wetness look and added some blood spray, that sort of thing. So it's, it always helps. Well, of course, it's good to have a very talented compositor to do it, but it yeah. always helps when there's practical elements already that's existing in the shot. Absolutely. Yeah, because then you can just sort of match to that and not have to recreate the whole, the whole person right. or something. Yeah, exactly. You get to work with what you have, right? Mm -hmm. Which, uh, I mean, I probably, you know, in some ways makes it easier, but then in others kind of forces you to problem solve a little bit differently because you're stuck with this shot. You can't just right. change the camera in 3D or, or move something over here. It's like, this is the guy, this is the, the take that they picked. You have to work with this one. Um, so that's definitely a big challenge in, in visual effects as well is, is working with what you have. You don't always have the option or the, the luxury to, yeah. to do things completely from scratch, even if you'd like to. If you're stuck with something, I mean, uh, and you really can't do a whole lot about it, I think the last solution is to cover it with CG. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, it's still it's the awful. same plate, I swear. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Uh, all right, so next we'll look at um, some work you did on The Boys. I love this show. I just started watching it this year, and I like ran through both seasons um, really quick. So it's really fun to see this stuff. There's so many cool effects like this. Um, so tell us about this one, this floating pop can effect. Yeah, so this was a fun one. Um, we did, a, we, did, we did a ton of work on the boys. Uh, actually, my role for this one was more CG supervisor and some FX stuff as well. So uh, in the boys, in this particular sequence, the idea was that he's lifting this can, which, which didn't exist over there. So we created it from a prop and a mix of references that we got. And then we used Maya to crush the can and enhance the crushing of the can using Houdini and also simulated some water coming out of it in Houdini. <clears throat> and of course it was all textured in Mari. So it just kind of went through the entire pipeline even though it's a simple asset. Right. 
One thing I was curious about is, um, were you given the artwork for the can by the art department of the show or did you have to create that as well? We did ask for it. it. It already existed. So I think it was, the can was actually there from the previous shots. So it did. Oh, okay. Yeah, and they must have already had to, you know, get that printed or whatever on the can before. Yep. That's pretty cool. Yep, we went through many, many iterations, adding little scratches and dirt and little fingerprints on the, on the, um, on the can itself and even running through many, many iterations of how much water should come out of it when it gets crushed and also how sharp the jagged edge is that sticks out that he's pulling towards himself. Right, right. Because I think the whole point was that he, sorry, spoiler alert, <laughs> is that he is using that cut to, or that can to cut through the, the duct tape on his hands yeah. or something like that. Yeah, so that makes, that makes sense. Um, and I think that's interesting to point it to about the, the artwork of the can. You know, a lot of our students, I know have, have wondered about, you know, whether to specialize in modeling or texturing and, you know, how that works and in visual effects, so much of what we create is um, given to us, especially when it comes to creative ideas like this. Sometimes the companies will ask um, a VFX company to create something like this, but in many cases, especially for a larger TV show or a franchise, <laughs> a lot of artwork already exists that we then have to, you know, use and apply in different scenes. So, you know, as long as you can model the can itself and then, you know, the texture artist can apply that artwork and then add some of the finishing touches you talked about, like the fingerprints and, and stuff like that. So a little bit of a different workflow compared to some artists who are used to doing everything themselves. <laughs> I just really like this sequence altogether, just because I, I thought that the can turned out really well. It looks very realistic. Yeah. And it, it's not an overly complex asset, the can itself, but there are some complicated things happening here. But mm -hmm. sometimes you, you know, when you look at less things on screen with not so much detail, it's a bit more pleasing to the eye. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so next we have another scene here. So this was a really cool scene I remember watching as I checked out the show. So you guys did the laser effect for Homelander. We did. So, so a lot of it, I mean, we sort of used 3D as a guide to do it because there's many ways to solve a sort of laser eye effect. But most of this is actually 2D work, mostly done in Nuke. Added lens flares um, selectively in different shots. Added smoke in this particular case because he's burning her chest. Mm -hmm. The burner her chest is a mix of different states of a matte painting that we are revealing or um, showing in the um, in different shots. So she also heals. So she's kind of getting burnt and then it heals over time. So if you watch the entire sequence and you can maybe read it a little bit better. Yeah, like, right? This part's really interesting here. It looks kind of charred and like still kind of on fire, but you can see some of the skin like forming back. That's a really cool shot. Yeah, that was the main goal for this uh, particular effect is that we didn't want it to look too burnt, but we, it also should look like it's still very hot after he turns off his laser beams there. Yeah, so it's not just like a switch that that turns off. Yeah, that makes sense. I, I think um, something worth mentioning too is whenever you're working with particularly 2D effects is really, well, the challenge in this particular sequence or any laser eye sequence is carrying over the exact same look for the, the rest of the shots. Because you give one shot to one artist, Someone else is going to do it a little bit different. So we try to QC all that stuff and make sure that the artists are having a reference to work with so that they all look the same. So tell me, that that's a really interesting point to bring up. Tell me a little bit more about your QC process. So like for these laser eye shots, for example, <clears throat> would you sort of look at all the laser eye shots together at once? in a review or like what's sort of your your way of tackling 
stuff like yeah. this. Generally speaking, Soho's process of reviewing shot work happens in our screening room, which is actually why we go into the office. Right. We do review everyone's work in the screening room so that it's easy for us to flip back and forth into different shots, load in um, maybe a keystone shot and flip it back and forth with each other shot. And if we're still unsure, then we'll contact sheet the entire thing and sort of pick out which shots look a little bit different. So it, it is a bit tricky because sometimes you'll have plates as well that are graded a bit differently. They're not all just consistently the same kind of lighting or color. Right. So those can kind of um, cause a bit of trouble just getting finesse and looking right. Right. Yeah. It's almost like what would this one look like in these conditions or like what would the same effect look like in this lighting or, or with this grade applied? Um, and for anyone who's wondering, just, I know he, he used the term contact sheet. So, um, many people are familiar with what that means for, you know, photography, but it's pretty similar for visual effects where you would lay out all of the similar or matching shots on the screen and look at them, be able to look at all of them quickly at the same time to figure out, okay, which one doesn't fit? Is there one that, here that doesn't look like it matches the rest or, or something like that? Awesome. Um, I would recommend everyone use that. But yeah, I mean, uh, as far as checking, checking overall work and color, I think or the way we screen stuff definitely helps a lot. Right on. All right, we'll go to the next show. So the last show we'll be looking at today is Umbrella Academy. Um, I'm just so excited because all these shows I love that we're talking about today. Um, I especially like this season. So walk us through, oh, I should loop this. Um, walk us through what's happening in this um, cornfield shot here. Yeah, a lot of my PTSD sort of feelings are coming back. No, uh, you looked we, at this one a lot, huh? <laughs> we did. So this was a show I also supervised at Soho. This one was actually a pretty fun project to work on. And the initial shot with a slow-mo bullet, that was a really fun one. Production gave us this crazy reference where the, a real bullet hits something, I think a wall, uh, and they somehow video captured it at 1 million frames per second. At least that's what Whoa. it says. I don't know how they did that, but <laughs> it's, it pretty much looks like what I have here. So nice. it's obviously gone through many, many, many iterations and um, we need to make sure that the muzzle flash looked correct and the way the ring was coming out looked like what it looked like in the reference. So it turned out quite well. And then if anyone watches the show, you know that Vanya has this force field effect. So that's kind of what's happening here is that she blocked it and now the force field effect is also disturbing all the crops around it. Leaves yeah. are getting torn apart. There's a bit of dust. So that's what you're seeing here. And all the corn stalks that you're seeing flowing around are all CG. And uh, they, it was simulated with vellum, which is a blessing in uh, a blessing in disguise. It's my favorite tool in Houdini for simulating pretty much a, a lot of different items. Not That's so one. cool. Yeah, it looks so realistic. Um, but I think like what's important about this shot, um, and you mentioned at the beginning, is is that reference you got. So how often, especially as an effects artist or a CG soup, um, have you, or even a VFX supervisor, anyone really in the VFX industry, how often do you use references to, to capture a, a shot like this or make right. sure that something looks realistic? Yeah, I think for VFX, reference is key to everything. If you don't have good reference, you can almost guarantee that your work's going to somehow look very fake. So we did have plates to work with. So we, we knew what the lighting looked like. So if probably can't see it because of the web feed, but there are real corn stalks in the background. And one thing that Soho does very frequently or as much as possible is actually go on set and take set photography. 
so that we know what something should look like in this particular kind of lighting. And of course, uh, we do have a very talented lighting team. Uh, we also use HDRs based on what was shot in place. And just our, our, our lighting pipeline is quite good. <laughs> so mm -hmm. so it, it does work out well and uh, we're able to render things realistically. Yeah, but yeah looks... re reference is very important to have. You must have reference all the time. Yeah, no matter what you're creating, really. Yeah, it's like you, you think about the reference for this part, the bullet, you're like, oh, of course. Like, you know, this looks, you could tell it's fake. It's this big, you know, slow-mo gag. But then about this other stuff and the corn stalks, it's really hard to tell what's real and what isn't. And, I, you know, watching this scene when I first saw it happen, again, it's one of those scenes where you can't really tell where, you know, the lines of reality end and where CG starts, which is the beauty of VFX, I think. And that's what really gets you pulled into some of these shows, especially shows like this about, you know, superheroes and, um, you know, different, you know, effects that, that they do and different powers that they have. So, and one thing, you know, it's so crazy to see all these corn stalks blowing around. And what you don't see is like the shot right after in this scene of like her standing in an empty feel which right. is like a rate a huge radius around her of everything blown up um so that's really cool no, um no, much what they did in this sequence uh, as you mentioned right they out all the corn stalks so there yeah, was go back. Uh, an empty field and then it's surrounded by corn stalks in the very far background and then we filled in everything else that was flattened with the cg corn stalks so that she could we could then simulate it happening. Ah, so it's almost like backwards. See, in my head, I was like, maybe they did it the other way around where you remove yeah. corn stalks, but sometimes it's, yeah, you, you yeah. add them and you have something empty first. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. Um, so we'll go to the next one here. And this is another really awesome Vanya scene. Right, yeah. So... Tell us about this. I was so amazed when I saw this. Um, and to hear that you guys did it at Soho was really cool. So yeah, walk I mean, us through this shot. It has water, so that's always a headache. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, water is never easy to do, and I never recommend any students to, to get into it. Actually, with my FX stuff, I don't even, my teaching, that is, I don't even bother teaching it. If you do learn it in school, you're, you're going to learn to push a button and not really understand how anything works. And I don't think that's really valuable at all. So it does take time to learn water. And even for us, um, a VFX company that's been around for many, many years with very powerful computers and talented people, it still takes us quite some time to get the simulation to look right and also control the water the way we want to. So if you can pause it in the first shot, maybe we can yeah, talk a little bit Yeah, let's go through this. There. So in this sequence, they actually just shot an empty field of grass. Uh, huh. Barn is not even there. Imagine there's no trees. It's just grass. <laughs> so this whole area. Oh my god. Yeah, so not even those trees aren't there on the left side. Oh, front. interesting. Yeah, yeah, this over here. Yeah, so you see, the, see. you see the grass on the bottom right? Yeah. It's just that. That's what was there for the entire field. So then we had to put in the pond, which uh, is obviously water, and then they had some grass, add some trees for environment, and some lighting. We also added some shrubs on the sides there just to make it look a bit more realistic. Mm -hmm. So when we're doing still water like this, I'll call it still water as in it's not really simulated. So this is kind of just using Houdini's spectrum water. This is a little bit easier to work with because there's no simulations to do. And or like very little anyway. It's just that that surface kind yeah. of wind. Yeah. Pretty much fancy 3D noise and you, you make the lighting look good and then that's great. But then we'll get into it starting to, her powers start to come out. Right. And then 
some forces get applied onto the water. So then this is kind of when it starts to boil and eventually it starts to rise. So there are a couple shots there where um, it's fairly out of focus. You kind of get away a little bit with murder, but the ones that's kind of far and very clear, we had to have some special sims to make it, to actually adhere to that shape because it was a very much an art directed shape that it needed to form for that particular shot. This, the shape you're talking about? That's right. So they kind of wanted a tidal wave looking thing and her force field is kind of pushing the water away, but they also didn't want it to look like an explosion. So it sort of has this noticeably circular under shape to it. Almost right. Like, like a rip curl, rip tide, rip curl. Yeah, so almost like she's controlling it. Like it doesn't look like yeah. it was just like one big boom. It's like she's holding it there. I guess yeah. that's so cool. And the trick there is really adding in all the little, fine little details that water would have when it's this far away. Adding enough mist so that it looks realistic and not covering the scene too much. Mm -hmm. And then eventually it all splashes down, which is also another oh, separate sorry. sim. Oh yeah, I forgot all about- keep, I keep clicking ahead. <laughs> I forgot all about the elevated parts. Yeah, that's the, that's what I want to talk about there. Is that like that part where she goes to get him when she's kind of like in underneath the water? That part's really cool. It looks like everything's kind of suspended in midair. I'll pause it in a second when it comes back up again. Yeah, I like yeah. this scene here. So, how did you achieve this sort of look? This it looks like. You know, you're kind of underwater, but everything is lifting off the ground. Yeah, so these are slightly, slightly less time consuming to simulate than the previous shot with the big water thing. So here we actually had some emission of water coming from the ground. And it's supposed to be that her powers are, have lifted most of the water, but there's some remnants and droplets that's kind of left in the air. Right. So we were doing some mix of matte painting and comp work to make the ground look wet. And then we had some droplets continuing to rise from the bottom as she has her power turned on. Mm -hmm. So I think these turned out quite well as uh, also. And uh, yeah, I like how these look. Yeah, it's such a, oh, and this one here, like flying through the suspended water. Right. So cool. That was part of a very heavy sim. So what we did was we took a frame of, of the tidal wave thing. Yeah. And added some extra simulations in there and sort of sculpted how the water should look in this particular shot while keeping the momentum slowly moving because it's kind of moving in um, sort of like slow motion time pretty much. Yeah, yeah. So a dramatic like, effect. <laughs> yeah. And then the camera sort of pushes forward and it looks kind of neat when you're going through the water. Yeah, it looks, it looks so cool. And then so about this last scene, so that's just the, the same simulation kind of falling down. But then even this here, because you said they shot it in a field, is all this part fake as well when she has him on the beach like this in the background? It is, yeah. So there is a patch of dirt there and everything else behind that patch of dirt is just grass. So it, huh. it's not as challenging because uh, we did, we were able to cover up with water. I think the more challenging part was doing the big matte painting of um, having to cover cover up the grass and making sure that it doesn't look like it's just been cloned. Right. <clears throat> and especially this one here. So yeah, that plate was extended on all corners because uh, when the drone shot was pulling out, it actually didn't pull out that far and we needed to make up the rest outside of what didn't exist in the plate itself. Oh, I see. To make it like more of an extreme sort of pull out angle. That's right. Yeah. Right. So all those trees are 
partially uh, matte painting and some of them are CG trees that are matte painter created. And, and you know, water. it really does give that that effect um, of being a little more, you know, extreme and, and grand than I think it would be if it was at the same framing as it was shot. Like, I'm, I'm assuming, like, you know, around here or something. Yeah. It, I guess it's my mouse, pretty, <laughs> actually. <laughs> pretty close to it. Um, yeah, so the, the goal here was to show the pond that it's it now has settled and he rescued... Harlan and everything's happy go lucky. Right on. Um, so I believe we have one more from. Oh no, that's it for for Umbrella Academy. That's it. Right. Next, cool. we're going to talk about recruiting. I'll go back to the slide for the final time. <laughs> I keep skipping right. ahead. Um, so, as um, a CG supervisor, VFX supervisor, and you've been at Soho uh, for quite a few years now. So you've had a hand in hiring artists there, as you've told That's me. Right. So tell, tell us a little bit about your perspective. So what it's like to be the person on the other side. I think a lot of students hear about, you know, other experiences from artists being someone who's looking for a job. But I think it's always interesting to get some insight from people who actually work at the studio who are looking to bring in the artists. So tell us about that. Yeah, um, I definitely have a lot to say about it. I've, uh, <laughs> We have a project right now that we're trying to finish, and I'm happy to say that we've we've pretty much uh, filled in the majority, if not all, the spots now with our art with artists to get the work nice. done. So I'm happy about that. Um, but I've had to do a lot of interviews since um, since September till about last week. Uh, that's probably the most interviews I've done for a very long time. So I, I thought I'd write down some stuff I noticed and sort of let people know that these are a few things you can do to sort of get a little bit more attention on yourself or at least, at the very least, not irritate whoever is going to <laughs> interview you. So, <laughs> um, okay, so Maxine, just let me know if I'm running too long, but I kind of have a list here. Oh, yeah, go for it. All right, so I think for your resume to begin with, um, even if you're a superstar animator or FX artist, whatever it is you're very good at, great, I get it, you're good at it. So um, don't just send your reel. I get it, it's cool, and there's information there, but you should also send a resume along with your reel, and that goes for anyone, because we need it for admin purposes. So someone at some point needs to get your information so that we can call you and get in touch with you. So yeah, so that's, make sure you have a resume. Next is, I see this quite a bit and I get it, we're comp or we're VFX artists, some of you are comp artists and we, we are not graphic designers. So we might not have something to edit PDF, but don't use a JPEG for your resume because you can't click on links on the JPEG. It's just a picture. And sometimes that's a little bit annoying and time consuming. So, and then for your actual resume, if you did make it a PDF, uh, make sure that your links actually work. I have seen some resumes where the email doesn't work or the link to their demo reel doesn't work. And that's never a good thing. Uh, another one is, I, I do see this more and more uh, recently but it is a good idea to include your current city and province of where you're at, at the very least, because some VFX studios are okay to hire worldwide and others just kind of want to hire locally. So really depending where you're going, but it's a good idea to include that and that it's actually valid. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that an important point to, to bring up about that, just from my own experience as well, is that when studios are looking to hire locally, um, it doesn't actually have anything to do with you as the artist. It's not personal. It's just usually based on different, you know, budgets or tax credits or even the how many visa applications that company is able to secure or have, um, which is harder and harder to get nowadays with, um, you know, with COVID, there are so many people who are looking for work here in this country. So it's very difficult to 
convince the government that you need to bring someone else from another country for this specific role. They're like, are you sure you don't have someone here you could hire? <laughs> so the visa process can be pretty tricky. So it's definitely not personal yeah, when companies really are looking for, for people here. Um, and especially VFX, a lot of it is because of tax credits. Like you have to live in Ontario. The artists have to live in Ontario when they work on something in order for the production company to get those tax credits back um, on their project. So um, just a personal. couple more pointers here for resume. Uh, some people like to write super long cover letters. I don't really read them. Maybe other people do, but if it's, if it's more than a couple of paragraphs, I'm definitely not going to read it. <laughs> I just want to see that, okay, this is a person that exists. They, they want to work for Soho. Great. That's good enough for me. Um, and then I know that we had different views on this one, Maxine. Um, I feel like if, if the job, the previous job you had is completely, completely irrelevant from the VFX work, then there's no need to include it. So don't needlessly embellish your resume just to add some padding in there. But if it does have something to do with it, then, then do include that. You know, if, if you've had, uh, I think a good example is if you've done some programming in the past, that's something that we value that you understand moving and becoming an artist. Yeah, it's all about finding those relevant skills. And I think that's, um, you know, why I try to, to talk to students about adding some of their previous experience, but it definitely depends on what it is. You can't just put something down because you've worked there. It's about finding those relevant or transferable skills or something that's related to the job you want that you've yeah. done before. So maybe you've managed a team before in some way, like that could be helpful. Um, but just saying that you've worked as, you know, a barista, but no real background as to what you did there and how that might be helpful for you now, yeah. probably best to leave it out. But yeah, if you can find, you know, any piece of information about that previous job that you did that could help you here, especially if you see it in the job description, a certain skill, you know, a soft skill, something like that, then you can add it. But I agree to, to not, same with the real, you don't want to add anything in there that isn't relevant or, you know, just to kind of bulk it up. That's not the goal. It's to sh showcase yourself in the best possible way. Um, yeah, for sure. Uh, um, and then I have some notes on real as well. Yeah. yeah, I have some notes as well. Okay, you got it all over there. Already. I got it, yeah. <laughs> Great. Um, We've yeah. planned this today. Thank you everyone for joining. <laughs> um, yeah, so I think most reels I've seen are short, which is good. That's definitely a big improvement in general. If you're a student, you're kind of just starting out, maybe you've done your first year or two, it's okay to have a reel that's a minute long or even 40 seconds long of good work. You don't need to have, it doesn't have to be two minutes. And if I can be completely honest, I, like I said, I watched all, or I've gone through a lot of interviews and I only really watch a very small fraction of them. And by fraction, I mean maybe less than 10 that I watch from start to finish. Most of them, I kind of skim through it to make sure it's good and that it's, um, it's actually the, the skill sets we're looking for then I'll probably ask more specific questions about the reel in the interview. Otherwise, I don't have time to watch, you know, 400 demo reels in a day. I have other stuff to do. So, yeah, so keep it short and just put all the relevant work that's there. Uh, yeah, another one here that uh, Maxine's put here is that it's a good idea to get it evaluated by a professional. So someone who's already working in the industry or maybe one of your instructors. Um, sometimes we, it's deceiving and we, we sort of fall in love with our shots, something that we've been working on for a long time, but maybe it's actually not that good or you're just putting in stuff that's making your, your shots work, look like they're worse than they actually are. So mm. do have someone check it out and make sure that 
get them to take it to take it out. So I I've actually given some advice or to people that applied at Soho and just told them that okay, you don't need to have this stuff in your reel. You should maybe make this stuff a little longer. Uh, yeah, that kind of thing. Yeah, I think uh, a lot of artists sort of they they keep things because they have a you know a certain emotion tied to it. Like yeah. maybe it was their very first project doing this sort of technique or you know maybe it's something that they put a lot of time into and so you know they they assume that like time equals you know greatness which you know is usually the case but not always especially if you've been doing this for a long time you know something that took you three weeks to do two years ago is probably you know much worse than something that you could spend a few hours on today if you've you know been improving as an artist so yeah i think getting that second opinion um is so key because it helps kind of take away some of those you know biases that you might have on your own work things that you find special because of you know whatever happened during that time you made it um might not actually make it that good um which is another great sort of thing for the students here at CG Spectrum is they have mentors who can look at their work right away. You're paired up with a mentor. And so you have these people to reach out to at any stage, you know, of your portfolio to say, hey, do you think this is good enough? Can you check out my reel? Is there something that you would remove? You know, what are your top three favorites? You know, if you had to remove one or two, which ones would they be? And the more people you ask, the more, you know, data you can kind of compile on your reel and say, well, you know, three to five people said I should remove this shot. So I think I should remove this shot, you know, and you can kind of gauge, gauge it that way. Um, but yeah, great. getting, getting outside of yourself, and sharing stuff is probably the most important thing. Sure. I would totally agree. Yeah. Um, and then you have some like specific notes on reels for certain departments. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so one thing I like to ask in interviews, especially for comp, if I'm unsure, um, especially if they don't have too much experience, um, I do ask how do they QC their own work? And sometimes they don't know how to answer that, which is a bit, a bit, um, I guess, Concerning. Surprising to me. <laughs> Surprising, yeah. <laughs> really important to know the answer for that. I won't answer it now, so I don't blow my cover when my when I ask this interview uh, <laughs> question here. But <laughs> figure out the answer for that. So there's there's a couple of things you can do so to make sure that you know how to quality check your own work without having to always bug the senior artist or the supervisor. So it's just one of those uh, important things that I'm sure you'll learn in CG Spectrum. Uh, okay, it's also good to include typical comp work, like the, the sort of uh, invisible effects type of stuff, the paint work, removing anything, uh, even wire removals. Those are also good to have. You don't have to have full CG shot in the middle of the screen all the time. Uh, you know, at the end of the day, if someone is recruiting someone else or an artist to do some work, if you're showing work that we are specifically doing in our shots, it would just make sense for us to hire you. So that's just something to think about. Yeah, that makes sense. All right. And for animation, uh, it is, I, I do see a mix of animation reels out there. It is good to have biped, quadruped biped and quadruped rigs, if you don't have quadruped, and also prop animation, especially if you want to get into VFX. And by prop animation, I guess that kind of falls more into technical animation type of stuff, like cars flipping over with the suspension kind of moving around. So those are, or maybe um, maybe swords that are props being used by by an actor, right, and even a little bit of rotomation. So those are things that I never really see in animation reel, but maybe the animator is not really interested in doing that either. But there is, uh, for VFX at least, there is a big requirement for that kind of work. Yeah, there's a huge need for that, I think. And it's not something that, again, going back to that idea of the stuff that makes you interested in the industry to begin with, like the really cool yeah. character animation, 
versus what a lot of these entry-level jobs require you to do, which could be, you know, like looking at Game of Thrones is like animating those swords. So it's live action plates. There's real people. You're not animating the whole person. You're just animating the sword in their hand or an arrow flying through the air, um, which isn't very, you know, glamorous <laughs> as, as it would be to animate a dragon, but someone needs to do it. And it's a great way to sort of get your start in the industry and work your way up to, to bigger level shots and stuff like that. It all depends, I think, on the project. So yeah, if uh, in the case of Game of Thrones, it is a small prop in the screen, someone's throwing it and it's all motion blurred, but sometimes it could be a large hero object like uh, an island that's rising or a ship that's kind of um, bobbing in the water or mm. it's rising the, from the ground type of thing. So those are different objects that are still animated that is not necessarily a character, but it does, there is a lot of work like that in VFX. So yep. that kind of goes to the next um, bullet point we have here is that you, you should consider the type of studio you're getting into. So do you want to do live action stuff or do you want to do 3D animation? Because that would determine what kind of work you're showing on your reel. Absolutely. And uh, then okay. uh, last but not least, FX. Yep, so for FX, uh, like what we have here, it's always a good idea to integrate your effects on some live action plate. Don't just do it over black. Um, I get it, you can't do this on every single shot because it takes too much time. You have to track and render and comp. You don't have to do it for every single shot. What I'm saying is you should have it on a few. And then if you wanna do some crazy water sims or some crazy uh, vellum sim, then you can do that over black and call it a test, but do have it rendered. It's just have some that is integrated showing that you understand what happens to your CG stuff inside uh, VFX Studio. And then for as far as like Houdini work goes, it's always helpful to show a little breakdown of the effects that you're doing. Mm. That way you are guaranteeing that you didn't kind of just take this setup from a tutorial or a, it's not just a shelf button where you clicked on one button and then you got your explosion. So yeah. always avoid <laughs> that kind of stuff. And uh, I think the one, the last bullet point here is something I don't see enough of from FX um, applicants is the procedural workflow that happens in Houdini. So you can do tons and tons of stuff with Houdini, but people always think it's only for FX, but you can actually do a lot of environmental work in scattering different types of props and populating a scene using Houdini Actually, they're now using it more and more in games to do that mm -hmm. kind of thing. So I don't see enough procedural workflow. And I think VFX as a whole could probably use more um, procedural Houdini stuff. I certainly wish we had it in past projects. And I'm always pushing to do more and more Houdini stuff in our future projects. Right on. Um, so we have some time for... Oh, no, sorry, I missed this one oh, section. Right. We'll talk this about this real quick. This was, <laughs> this was really important. <laughs> yeah, so we were yeah, talking so. about interviewing and especially uh, interviewing nowadays with, you know, just the age of COVID and people not working in offices or you're, you know, someone international that's getting a job somewhere else. But video calls are the most important form of interviews now. So you gave me some tips for having a successful video call interview. So tell me about some of your tips here. Yeah, for sure. Uh, so one thing that you got to realize, some people are camera shy. I would have to say I was kind of camera shy. I did not want to be in front of cameras. And now I don't have a choice because <laughs> I have to teach and I have to be in front of a camera. And on top of that, we, we do our reviews on a regular and you have to be in front of the camera. So you can't really avoid it anymore. So you might as well go out there, get a camera, get a microphone so that you don't sound like you're underwater because yeah. you will use it anyway. Um, Another important thing is before you go to your interview is to make sure you, you just ask what 
platform they're going to use to interview with you with because you don't want to go on the interview and then you can't figure out how your camera works or I don't know zoom you didn't know you had to install zoom you didn't know it existed for some reason but these are things I've seen is that some people don't have cameras some people are walking around with their cell phone and it looks like the entire world is shaking <laughs> or they're everything's just completely dark or they're blown out you, you don't want to be in that situation for your interview you kind of want to look like you're prepared to take a call and continue to work having a camera in front of you mm -hmm. yeah. and uh yeah and then just make sure that it works maybe get in touch with a friend and try it out just make sure that the video stuff works yeah, almost, yeah, you almost want to like art direct your your box that you're in, you know, <laughs> you want to make sure that the angle works and, you know, yeah. that your lighting, you can see them. So ask your friend, can you see me clearly? Can you hear yeah. me now? <laughs> yeah, that's, I think that's very valid right there. Yeah. Uh, okay. And then the last thing here is, you know, uh, some people know what they want. Um, some people don't. So I think it is a good idea to do some research on what the particular role is that you're applying for, what it should pay. Uh, something to keep in mind is that every project has a budget and every studio has a certain budget. So you want to make sure that you're within that line. So no one's really going to tell you what you should get paid, but you kind of want to you don't want to price yourself out of a position just because you're looking for the extra couple of thousand. It just really depends on what you want to do. So mm -hmm. uh, that's just something you should do research on. Don't show up to the interview not knowing anything really. Um, yeah. But if, if you're a junior, I would say just take the job, <laughs> get some experience because I always say that the first two years of work, at least in VFX, is kind of like paid training. You're you're learning a lot and you're getting paid for it. So you should be happy. And then after that, you can try to move around if you want to, and then try to negotiate for better pay if you feel like you're not getting paid enough. Yeah. And have conversations with your manager. You know, I think not enough people really get to know their direct manager or their supervisor to get some insight or, or to talk about their goals. You know, a lot of people just like get to work and they sit down and that's all they're thinking about, but it's good to talk to the people who manage you about, you know, what your plan is for the next five years or 10 years. And cause if you don't tell them then they won't know and they won't be able to help you achieve that goal. You know, a lot of artists get frustrated because like, oh, well, I'm quitting this company because no one understands me or, or like, I'm not getting that supervisor position that I want so bad, you know? And you're like, well, did you tell them that you wanted to be a supervisor? <laughs> no. <laughs> well, that might help, you know, because then they might be in a better position to actually help train you, even if it's a little thing over here, or maybe you can, you know, go with George on set or, you know, something like that. It Sometimes it takes baby steps, but you can't take those steps if nobody knows about it um if you're just keeping everything to yourself everyone's like waiting for their like american idol you know scenario to just be found you know yeah. <laughs> to, to get really offers <laughs> but you really have to put in so much effort and yeah. like a conscious effort to talk to people about what you want to do next it doesn't just fall into your lap yeah. um in most cases <laughs> for sure i think that's a really very valid point yeah uh, <laughs> Soho is a, a place where we're very open to letting artists grow. But if you don't ask, we, we truly don't know what, what your end goal is. Because some yeah. people, we'll just take a compositor as an example. Some compositors could be working for years. They could be working for a decade as a compositor. And they have zero interest in doing any supervision work. Mm -hmm. But others, they, they want to get into that sort of thing. So unless you say anything, yeah, no one's going to know. Yeah. And, and it, it goes both ways too. I've met a lot of artists who don't want to be leads um, or supervisors because they don't want that extra pressure. They like this 
form of work where they show up, they have their shots to do, they have their tasks, they do them and they go home. Because when you, when you are a supervisor or a lead, that's when you start to get extra responsibility. And that's when you start to manage other people. And, yeah. you know, it's no longer about just doing your artistic work. You now have to take all this time to do other stuff like interviewing. <laughs> There's all this time involved that takes you away from your actual uh, work. So um, we have a couple, we have a few minutes for a couple of questions here. So everyone feel free to um, ask some questions in the Q&A area here in Zoom or right in the chat. So I'll go over some that were asked uh, a few minutes ago. So we have one question from Damien. He says, hi, I wanted to ask how the supervisor chooses where to give each job. Do many artists, uh, are many artists involved in one effect and what are responsibilities of an entry level artist? By the way, thank you for organizing. Um, so we'll start with the first, there's like three questions in one. So we'll start with the first one. As a supervisor, how do you choose where to give each job? So I'm assuming they're talking about departments. So how do you sort of plan out, um, you know, a shot and who works on what? Usually we'll get a sequence edit. And then depending on the scope of work for that particular edit, it would determine whether it's all going to be just 2D work or we need to track it and do all the CG stuff. So depending on the complexity of the shot, we will assign those to artists that would be capable of getting the work done. So if someone is very junior, then we're not going to give them, you know, CG dragons and uh, all these explosions to do. It's going to be a little bit simpler. But in, in a place like Soho, if you're showing that you're kind of just hammering through these junior shots, then we'll introduce more comp complex shots to you. So that's generally how we, we do things. Um, that usually a supervisor and producer will look at the edit and then figure out who's going to do what. Nice. Um, and then the second question was, uh, are there many artists involved in one effect? Uh, that oh, it all depends, depends on the effect. <laughs> Yeah, so that all depends on, again, the complexity of the shot. So the shot you saw earlier with the dragon flying over um, Winterfell, so yes, yeah. a shot like that would pretty much involve the entire company. So there's a lot of modeling of all the different props and buildings. There's some effects work to do to do some procedural snow and distribute some trees. Mm -hmm. We need a comper to comp the shot, obviously texture artists, lighters, that's involving every, everybody. So a shot like that will usually drag on for quite some time. Anytime CG is involved, you can guarantee that it's going to take a long time to do. But yeah. some shots are 2D work. So, uh, so those are maybe green screen or some sort of wire removal or maybe enhancing the, the blood on the sword those can mostly be um, done in Nuke, especially now that Nuke has 3D tracking. And even a lot of the Ember effects that we've done, those were all done in Nuke. So those can just be done on the 2D end and maybe get a track from a track camera from the tracking department. So those are always nice because we finish them fairly quickly. Right on. Um, and then last question from Damien uh, was, what are the responsibilities of an entry-level artist? So why don't we pick a specific department for that? Because I think it depends. So let's say for an effects artist, what would be what would they kind of be doing as an entry level artist? I think we kind of get right right at the beginning. We kind of get a sense of how much this person can do. You can kind of tell looking at their reel what they've done and what they have experience doing. So first, we'll give them stuff we know that they should be able to do, and if they can do it, then. Uh, we'll start introducing more complex work. Mm -hmm. And what we always do with any juniors coming in, which we, we don't actually take a whole lot of, is we always pair them up with someone very senior so that they can look over them and make sure that they're doing everything properly. So that's, that's actually one of the things I'm doing right now with uh, one of our FX artists. Um, they're working with me directly and I'm giving them some of the offloading some of my work with them and uh, making sure that they're doing all that, uh, all that work as efficiently as possible and uh, also getting done in a relatively short time. Yeah, and I think that's standard for 
um, for many companies or many different departments. I think it's um, even if you're someone who works in production, usually when you start an entry level position, you're shadowing someone else, someone who's a little more experienced. You might get a lot more basic tasks or, you know, sort of boring or repetitive tasks on your plate, depending on the, um, the department you're in, or you might have to match an effect that was done by a more senior artist and then iterate that on some shots. So a lot of what you're doing is um, sort of, you know, smaller tasks, easier tasks, repetitive tasks. And then with the help of someone more senior, they kind of figure out what you're capable of and, you know, what else they can give you as you sort of improve. Um, you're, you're basically propagating work because uh, yeah. a, a typical VFX house we're not going to work on 12 shots. It's going to be, you know, maybe 200. So yeah, not all those 200 shots is going to be hero complex shots. A lot of them could be repetitive uh, sequential work. So right. we kind of just need bodies to do that. Um, so next question here we have from Rebecca. If approached by a company to work on an animation project of theirs, what sorts of things should I expect during a first meeting or are there any key questions that I should ask? Yeah, for animation in particular, uh, I don't have a whole lot of say for, for animation companies uh, like that do 3D full 100% CG animation because I haven't really worked at a place like that, but those mm -hmm. places typically have some sort of quota of animation. So you might want to ask about that because that's the kind of um, work you'll probably do. If you are getting into VFX, so this is a bit of a tricky one. Uh, a lot of animators want to animate characters and creatures, but that's not always the work that is in a VFX studio. It's like what I said earlier, we tend to animate a lot of props and, and objects that are not necessarily characters. So mm -hmm. you might want to ask, what are you going to animate? So right. as a junior animator, it might be, you know, you want to make sure you're not animating an octopus fighting another octopus that, you, that might get you into a bit of trouble. So yeah. you obviously want to ask. Yeah, right. ask what the project's about and see if that's something you're, you're comfortable with, I guess. If you're, especially if you're being approached by them, it kind of gives you that, that, that power to ask more questions about what they, they expect from you if they're reaching out to you. However, if they've reached out to you, then that most likely means that they've seen your reel, perhaps. And so maybe they're already interested in the you know, level of quality that you can create. So I would definitely just try to ask for more information about the project. Um, here's a good question um, from another person here. As a junior comp artist, how can you make yourself stand out if you're mainly doing beauty work? Not sure what the beauty work means. Like, like, uh, like touch up, like removing wrinkles. I, I've done a lot of that in my past uh, job. <laughs> It'd be like removing wrinkles off like characters. Uh, it's a lot of like 2D sort of comp work where you're like fixing up people's appearances. Um, so I guess, I guess what they're trying to ask here is they're being pigeonholed kind of doing one type of shot mainly. Um, and so they're wondering like, how, how can they stand out if they're always being tasked to do the same thing? That one's a bit of a tricky, a tricky one because yeah. it, uh, it's kind of like, um, what is the term when the actor is getting typecast? <laughs> typecast. Yeah. You're kind of getting typecasted to do this thing. So sometimes, and I've seen this happen. Sometimes if someone is really, really good at, let's say, a task like tracking. So a lot of people don't like tracking, but hey, we are thankful because our tracking artists, they like to track. So uh, if you're doing a particular task that you don't like to do, but you're very good at it, then you might just continue to get that because you're doing it twice as fast as everyone else. But really, I think to get out of that, if you're just doing a patchwork that you want and you want to, you feel like you're capable of doing more, you should talk to your lead or manager and say, hey, look, I'm hammering through the stuff and I think um, my work looks pretty good. So I, I want to try something a bit more complicated. 
and sometimes depending on the project, maybe the particular project only has a handful of hero shots and th maybe those will just go to the senior artist. So just on a management perspective, you can't really blame them for giving that to the senior artist because you know, they're probably paying more to, to have those people there and they'll give them the more complex shots. Mm -hmm. I think, cause I've, I've done a lot of that sort of work with my teams and the artists I've worked with in the past. I'd say a really easy sort of thing that, that artists fall into is when they get sick of doing something like beauty work, for example, in this patchwork kind of repetitive stuff is they end up getting sort of annoyed with it and then getting upset that they have to do it. And then they just start doing worse and worse and worse. Yeah. Um, or they take longer and longer because they're like, oh, it's this again, um, which is very easy to sort of fall into um, if you don't feel any progression. But I think in addition to talking to your manager, as George said, I think anything you can do to sort of really rock it at that task like as much as you hate it or want to do something better if you can prove that you can do this repetitive thing that they're giving you and knock it out of the park do it faster than everyone else on your team but at the same level of quality i think those are skills that will get you noticed and help sort of help your cause if you talk to your manager you know because just talking to them and saying hey i'm sick of this work isn't enough but if you say hey you know really sick of this beauty work but i've improved my speed i can now do them twice as fast as i could you know a few weeks ago so i'm really trying here you know give them something back show that you're stepping up to the plate and stepping up yeah. to these tasks and then they'll be more likely to give you more um, but if you just kind of complain to them about the work that you're doing, then yeah. people usually are not as sympathetic about that because someone's got to do it anyway. Like that's the work that the studio was given by the company. You know, we don't always control the work that we work on. Um, so it's always nice to kind of really prove that you could do it no matter what the task is or how boring it might be. Um, so we have a couple... I'll add a bit of something there. You, you yeah, yeah, go ask, for it. Um, your lead, I'm sure they have a bunch of work while uh, looking over your stuff. You can ask them if they need any help on anything. And then uh, th that might be a good way to get noticed. Because they're probably doing more complex work than the, the typical patchwork. Right. Um, all right. So we'll have time for... Uh, one other question here. So I'm just trying to pick out, so a lot of these questions we kind of answered in this presentation. Um, so things to put on a resume if you um, don't have any experience, like George said before, just focusing on putting your school and any training you have is enough and then everything else should be the skills that you've learned. So focus on building up that skills section. Um, and then what do we have here? So we have one from Matthew. He says, I noticed when looking for jobs, there are some that I'm otherwise qualified for, but they require on the job experience that I don't have. What are some tips for finding a company that hires first timers? Yeah, okay, that's, that's a, actually a really good question. Um, so I'll just use Soho as an, as an example. Our, all our job postings are going to say we want three years of experience or more. So I think that's kind of what you're asking for anyway. So mm -hmm. we generally, that's, what, that's the ideal amount. But that's not to say that there's a very skilled animator out there that kind of just went straight out of school or has maybe six months or one year experience. And they're just very talented at animating. So to us, we might feel like the work, the quality of work you're doing is equal to someone who's got maybe two, three years experience. So I think you should just try to apply anyway. It doesn't hurt. And maybe if you're lucky, you can get an interview and get a job. And if you don't get a job, you can always ask your interviewer what else you can do to try to get the job in the future. But, you know, we've had multiple applicants that tried uh, a few times to get in to Soho and some of them, they were finally able to get in. So it's sometimes it's just timing as well. So it might be that you are a good junior, like quite good, but 
our budget allowed us to get a couple senior animators that just turns out to be better than you. So it's sometimes just timing. So I say just keep trying and keep working on your skills and yeah, keep trying to get to a place that you really want to get into. That is some great advice. Um, and yeah, I think at the end of the day, any artistic positions, it's all about that reel, all about the portfolio. You know, if you have a stellar reel, but no production experience, you know, they're going to look at the reel first. A lot of the other stuff they can train at the studio. So if you have, you know, some really amazing stuff in your reel, they will overlook the other parts that might be missing on your resume. So as long as you're continuing to improve yourself artistically, I think um, you'll have a good shot. Uh, but yeah, that, that, that three years thing is so daunting. I remember being in that same position when I first started. It's that, that age old conundrum of, you know, you have to get experience to get experience or you have to have experience to get experience, um, <laughs> which is so hard to get. Um, so that concludes our presentation for today. Um, for any unanswered questions, please feel free to reach out to me. I'm going to uh, drop my email in the chat here. Um, but it was really nice to have you here with us today, George. I'm sure all of our students are really excited to have you as their mentor for those who are lucky to have you. And yeah, I'm really, yeah. actually quite thankful to have uh, to be part of uh, CG Spectrum. It's, it's been good. The system's great. I really like how everything's just so organized. Uh, but it's it's great i really like uh how everything's set up that's and great that, that I'm, personal I'm glad you're enjoying that, it so far <laughs> what's that i'm glad you're enjoying it so far even as a mentor not, not just a yeah. student <laughs> yeah, just uh the personal time that each student gets i think that is really important and yeah anyway thanks to everyone that watched <laughs> uh, i don't know how many people watch but yeah, we had, we had just over 30 for most of it. Um, but thank you all so much for joining. And thank you, George, for coming on camera. I know you said earlier that you were, you used to be camera shy. Uh, not anymore. <laughs> but this, this is really great. And I'm sure that there is a lot of great information here that we talked about today that will help um, all of the aspiring VFX artists out there when they start looking for work. So thank you all so much for joining us. And thank you again, George. And I hope everyone has a wonderful evening. All right, bye everyone. Bye all, thanks. <laughs>